Hello, today we're going through Econ 201 Macro 1, Sessions 3 and 4. This is the neoclassical growth theory discussion, and specifically we're looking at the savings function, which is the third component in the neoclassical growth theory that we still have to go through. Previously, we've looked at the production function, and if you recall, the production function suggests that as we increase capital stock per person, shown by the lowercase k, output per person will increase. We also noted though that when capital stock per person increases, output increases, output per person increases, but at a decreasing rate. And this is because of diminishing marginal returns. We also looked at the investment function or the investment requirements shown mathematically as lowercase n plus lowercase d k. Lowercase n stands for the population growth rate, and lowercase d stands for the depreciation rate of capital. So the reason why we have to take into account population growth and depreciation is because both increases in the population growth rate and increases in depreciation that take place in each year can affect the value of capital stock per person. And if we do not replace our capital stock per person through investment, then the population growth and the depreciation will erode the value of capital stock per person and cause it to decline. So we need investment in order to maintain the level of capital stock per person in a country. And also, if we wanted to increase the amount of output per person, we would need more capital stock per person and to increase the amount of capital stock per person, we would need to increase the amount of investment per person. This then brings us to the savings function, because how do we increase the amount of investment per person? How could a country go about increasing the value of investment per person that takes place? Well, the country would need to have access to a pool of savings from which it could borrow in order to finance this investment per person that is needed. And that's where the savings function comes in. In particular, the mathematical notation for the savings function is S is equal to, and I'm going to use a different color here, S, Y. Okay, so what does this suggest? It suggests that savings per person depends on the savings rate. So S here in red, is the savings rate. So it tells us the percentage of output per person that is saved. Okay? And y is then output per person. So, for example, if the savings rate is equal to 20%, and output per person is equal to 100, then savings per person is equal to 20. Okay? You may also see the savings function written as um, S is equal to S, F, K. All right? And we can do that because F, K is simply Y. All right? So this is another way of writing that the savings function is dependent on output per, per person, because output per person is a function of capital per person. And this way of writing the savings function is actually very useful when it comes to graphing the savings function. And so that's what we need to move towards doing. We're going to draw the set of axes. It's the same set of axes that we have been using up until now. So we draw in the set of axes, remember to label them. So on the vertical axis we have output per person, output per person, and on the horizontal axis we have capital per person, or the capital to labor ratio. Okay, And what we want to do is graph the savings function. Now, in order to graph the savings function, we have to take note of the relationship between the savings function and the production function. So, in fact, what I'm going to do is draw in the production function first, and then we will think about how the savings function links 
to the production function. So the production function, as you recall, tells us as capital per person increases, how does output per person increase? So if the level of capital stock per person is K1, then output per person would be Y1, say, Y1. And because it's going to help us just now, let's put some values to this. So let's say that capital per person is 10, okay, and output per person is 200, all right? And that's the first point then on our production function. When capital per person is 20, then output per person, let's say that that's 280. Okay. And that that is 280. All right. And that when capital stock per person is 30, that output per person is 340. Mm -hmm. So that's 340. All right, when we draw these together, just note if there's no capital per person, then there's no output per person. So the production function starts at the origin. When we link these all together, that is then our per capita production function. It's positively sloped, so we need more capital stock per person in order to increase output per person. But as capital stock per person increases, output per person increases at a decreasing rate. Now what we need to do is draw in our savings function. And if I assume a savings rate of 20%, you can do that, then what we have is information about capital stock per person and output per person. So we're able to actually calculate the amount of savings that takes place at each capital to labor ratio. So when the capital to labor ratio is K1, output per person was 200. So what is the amount of savings? Well, if the savings rate is 0 0.2 and output per person is 200, then the amount of savings per person is going to be 40. Okay? So, we know that when output per person was 200, the level of capital stock per person was 10. So, when the level of capital stock per person was 10, the amount of savings was 40. Okay, so we can plot that in. Let's put it there, roughly 40. So that's S1 equal to 40. Okay? When the capital to labor ratio increased to 20, Output per person increased to 280. So, assuming that the savings rate remains unchanged, but that output per person has gone up from 200 to 280, the new level of savings per person would be 56. So here, we can plot the new savings per person and that would be S2 is equal to 56. Note, so when capital stock per person was 20, output per person was 280, and when output per person was 280, savings per person was 56. And to do the last one, in terms of the figures that we have here, when the savings rate was 20%, but output per person was 340, then savings per person would be 68. Okay? And so we can draw in here our point S3 is equal to 68. And also, again, note that if there's no capital stock per person, then there's no output per person. And if there's no output per person, then there's no savings per person either. So when you draw these in, 
what you should notice is three things. First, the savings function is positively sloped. As the capital to labor ratio in increases, output per person increases. If we save a constant percentage of our output per person, then savings per person also increases as output per person increases. So there's a positive relationship between the capital to labor ratio and output per person, and between output per person and savings per person. That's the first thing. The savings function is positively sloped. The second thing is that the shape of the savings function follows the shape of the production function. And that's because if output increases, if output per person increases at a decreasing rate as capital to labor ratios increase, then savings per person must also increase at a decreasing rate because we're saving a constant percentage of output per person and output per person is increasing at a decreasing rate. So if you were to work out, and I'm not going to do it for you because I think this is a useful exercise for you to do by yourself, when we increased capital stock per person by constant amounts, 10 units, and then a further 10 units, and then a further 10 units, output per person was increasing at a decreasing rate. Linked to that, if you were to work out the amount by which savings changed from S1 to S2, and then from S2 to S3, you would see that savings per person was increasing at a decreasing rate. So the second thing then is that the savings function follows the slope of the production function. Because output per person increases at a decreasing rate, and because we save a constant percentage of output per person, therefore savings per person also increases at a decreasing rate. The third thing to take note of is that this savings function lies below the production function. And in particular, it lies below the production function because part of our output per person is going to be saved, but we're not saving all of it. We're only saving, in this example, we were saving 20% of our output per person. So in fact, this savings function lies roughly 20, is roughly only 20% of the total output per person which is generated. What do you think the remaining, or the gap between the production function and the savings function represents? What do you think this distance is showing, for example? I'm not going to tell you, but I think that that's something that you should that you should think about. Okay, all right. So that's then our savings function. What we have now got is we have a production function, an investment requirement, and a savings function. And I'm going to do another video separately, which then links all of these things together to make the neoclassical growth theory.